Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, thank you to our panel for being here tonight. My name is Will Den. I'm an assistant professor of emergency medicine and sports medicine at the University of Arizona. And as the co-chair of our newly minted fellows online education subcommittee, we wanted to welcome all of you to our inaugural lecture tonight. Um, none of this could have been possible without dedicated educators and members such as Dr. Ashman Rao and others like him around the country. Our education committee leaders, Rebecca Myers, Anna Waterbrook, and our subcommittee. And the purpose of this particular initiative is to bring the national experts and the educators that you see before you today um, to kind of help be an adjunct to your education as a fellow. And so we spent the last few months as our subcommittee developing a schedule of live lectures that will continue year round. And um, this is really just the first of many initiatives planned and we welcome any sort of feedback that you might have so we can continue to iterate this process and make this initiative as great as possible. And I wanted to hand it over to my co-chair, Jim Moeller, um, for a few words. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, uh, Will. I appreciate uh, everyone joining in tonight. You know, back in March, our everybody's lives changed and uh, the education of fellows changed. Um, Ashwin Rao started putting together schedules to coordinate directors from across the country and presenting lectures for uh, fellows as everyone lost their ability to spend direct one-on-one -on -one time with fellows. And we, uh, I worked with Ash to put together recorded lectures out on YouTube to, again, try to give fellows an opportunity to continue to learn, even though they may have been pulled into different areas. And from that, uh, the, the board of the AMSSM decided this was an initiative that we needed to keep going. And it's so, so exciting to see it finally gets started tonight. It's, it's been a lot of work. Uh, Will and, and uh, Heather, our, our fellow uh, representative and our whole subcommittee has done a tremendous job in getting this started. And, and uh, I wanna thank Andy Meyer as well from the AMSSM uh, for, for helping us so much. And we've got a fantastic panel to kick this off. And since COVID is the reason that we started doing this, it's a great way to, to get going. So welcome everyone. We're, we're horribly excited to get going with this and we can't wait to, to kick this off tonight. So. Uh, so I'm just very excited and I want to see this get rolling. So welcome everyone and thank you. Thanks, Jim. Go ahead, Heather. Hi, my name is Heather Saffel. I just graduated fellowship from Emory and I'm now in South Bend, going to work at Beacon Medical Group and affiliated with the Notre Dame Fellowship. Um, I just want to say this is an amazing platform for education. It all started with coronavirus, one of the positives that came from it. Um, but I learned so much from other programs and, and from my experience as a fellow then, I hope that all of you fellows currently, maybe you participated back then, but you continue to join in on the lectures and share it to um, the fellows who aren't able to make it tonight. Just continue to make sure you're learning and trying to get everyone engaged in this because it really is a wonderful opportunity to hear from other programs and um, people throughout the country, especially we weren't able to have AMSSM and hear from so many of the wonderful speakers. So please continue to be engaged and thank you for participating tonight. Thank you, Heather. All right, Jason, show's yours. I'm just gonna be in the background, looking at the chat, helping you with moderation. All right, thanks, Will. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, we'll go through a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, Will's already mentioned uh, what really the point of this subcommittee and really the goals are, um, in particular for this hopefully uh, one time off unique year, but really to serve as an adjunct to your individual programs, educational programming, and really you know, to assist with the CAQ exam preparation, provide fellows with access to educational experiences with really experienced AMSM members, um, at times guest experts. The very first uh, I guess non-COVID uh, lecture will be tomorrow. Dr. Nate and I will be the moderator and Dr. Douglas Casa um, will be speaking on uh, heat injury. Um, so that's obviously one that you don't want to miss. That's the, the first uh, talk is tomorrow. So that'd be a great one to kick it off. Um, just for everyone um, who uh, is on right now, please mute your devices, microphone, take yourself off video. Uh, the panel, of course, can, can not uh, do, need to do that. If you have any questions, please submit the questions through the chat function. If you want, by all means, you can uh, include your name, though I think the Zoom program will automatically pick it up in your program if you want. Um, for this particular uh, evening, I actually have 13 questions that's already been 
uh, brought to my attention. Um, so I think we're going to hit the big, big points, but if there's something there, by all means, please submit it, and Will and I will try to get to them as well for our distinguished panel. Um, after the program, please complete the evaluation, which will be available on AMSM Collaborate, and uh, Andy Meyer is going to be very helpful with that. Again, thank you to the subcommittee, in particular, Will, Jim, and Heather, who just spoke, but everyone in the subcommittee has been working tirelessly to, to get this really educational initiative out there, um, something that, uh, you know, kind of make a, you know, lemonade out of lemon, so to speak, for this year. So, um, so really, really proud to, to be assisting the entire team. And of course, we, we can't do any of this without our staff uh, in Kansas City. Everyone up here has been unbelievable. Um, I feel like I call Andy Meyer at least once a week now on my cell phone. So um, thank you to everyone in Kansas City for your tireless work. So now on to our expert panel. So we have 10 experts uh, tonight. And normally, uh, the way I try to do is give everyone a good two, three minute introduction. That is not possible because we've used up the hour and a half. So I'm going to do a very brief introduction for every one of our uh, panelists tonight. Dr. James Clugston, uh, who is a fellow in AMSM and an associate professor, uh, and I'm fortunate to work with him here at the University of Florida. He is a team physician for uh, our UAA, UF Athletics, in particular for football and men's basketball. Dr. Carly Day is the head team physician for Purdue University, and she is on the AMSM board of directors. Dr. Alex Diamond is also a fellow in AMSM and associate professor at Vanderbilt, and he's a team physician amongst every uh, other role that he has right now. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Dresner, again, a fellow for AMSM, a professor, a team physician at the University of Washington, again, amongst many other roles, and he's a past president of AMSSM. Dr. Jonathan Finoff uh, used to be at the Mayo Clinic and took on this little role called Chief Medical Officer of the United States Olympic Paralympic Committee on March 1st, and he's a former AMSM Board of Director. Dr. Melody Rubesh um, is currently uh, working for Rothman Orthopedics in the New York Division, and she's the Medical Director for the Radio City Rockets. Dr. Christopher Myring is a command surgeon in the U.S. Army Training and Doctrine, uh, Doctrine Command. Dr. Benjamin Oshlag is an assistant professor at Mount Sinai New York Medical Center and emergency room physician. And many of you uh, might remember, uh, Dr. Oshlag gave probably one of the most stirring talks that I've heard in, in a long time when talking about uh, COVID uh, this past April when we had a virtual AMSM 2020. Dr. Brandy Waite, who I've had the good fortune of knowing for many years, she is a professor at UC Davis in California, and really germane to th uh, this evening, uh, she's medical director for a lot of mass events, in particular California International Marathon, and also for the Ford Deserts Ultra Marathons. And last but not least, Dr. Anna Waterbrook, who's a professor, team physician, and an assistant uh, fel uh, fellowship director at the University of Arizona, and uh, Dr. Waterbrook is also on the AMSM Board of Directors. Uh, my name is Jason Zremski. I am uh, one of your moderators, along with uh, Will, uh, who just introduced himself a little while ago. What I'm going to do is stop the share and get started. So, um, you know, there's no good way to, to say it any other way is COVID has affected us in many different ways, professionally, personally, socially. Um, there's a good chance that my friend will probably run in at some point in Zoom bomb this call, as many of you already have seen her on a lot of calls. So these are things that we're dealing with with the new normal. So I want to kind of just start this off with how has COVID really COVID impacted your area of expertise? And what I mean by area is the kind of the geographic location. So I want to start off possibly with Ben and Melody in New York before jumping on to Anna, Brandy, and Jay with some of the uh, hot spots in Arizona, California, and Florida. So, so Ben or Melody, let's kick it off. Uh, sure, I can start. Um, so it's it feels weird uh, because we were absolutely in the middle of the worst of it uh, through March and April. I've never seen anything like it. I don't know if I'll ever see anything like it again. I hope not. Um, and then things got really, really quiet, especially in, in uh, throughout the city and in, in emergency departments. Uh, for a month or two, we, we really scaled back our staffing. We were seeing almost nobody. Uh, and in the last like three, four weeks, uh, month, month and a half, um, things have started to pick back up. We're not back to normal volume yet, or maybe in our, our emergency department, maybe 75% uh, of normal, two thirds or so, but there's very, very little COVID. Um, and I was thinking about, you know, when I gave that talk at AMSSM, I was right in the middle of it and I had no idea sort of how other people around the country, what they were experiencing. And now I feel like I don't really know what's going on in Florida and Houston and uh, Arizona and those sorts of places. You know, I have an idea of what we went through, but I, I, I don't 
have that that connection to to what's going on because what I see around me is it's not normal. I mean, most people are walking around in masks. When I see people uh, in inside places without masks or or not doing the appropriate things, you know, it it, it bothers me and I react to that and um, sort of adjusted to that that new new normal. Um, but people are starting to live their lives again. They're coming, you know, but what I see in the emergency department is normal emergency department stuff. Um, you know, I, in my, my job prior to the, the one where I am now, I was doing a, about 50, 50 sports in, in ER and at this job because of COVID, uh, a lot of it, uh, I've been doing hundred percent ER, uh, and there, you know, hasn't really been an opportunity to work that sports back in yet. Um, so that has sort of, uh, affected me personally. Um, with, with where I am, but uh, things are, they're not back to normal, but they're settling into what might be a new normal, which is, is interesting. But I also, there's a, a very real sense for me at least of, it's just a matter of time before we start to ramp back up again. Dr. Rubesh, what are your thoughts being in New York as well? Well, first off, I think I need to echo your talk about how amazing Ben's speech was and his presentation at AMSSM. That was awesome, Ben. I am part of an orthopedic outpatient group. So we actually, two of my partners tested positive in the second week of March. And um, so we just shut everything down because at that point, nobody knew what was the safe way to handle things, how to take care of patients. We just wanted to not be adding to the situation. So then we re quickly realized that New York was, the ERs were overloaded. And so we tried to open up in a way that we could just offload the ERs as much as possible. So anybody who said showed up in an urgent care or went to the ER, we said, just send them to us. We'll take care of any orthopedic issue so that you guys can concentrate on what you have to do. And then slowly we've reopened. So we are actually fully open. But I also take care of Broadway and Radio City Rockettes. And of course, Broadway has officially announced not being open until at the earliest January of 2021. And uh, Radio City just announced this morning that they're canceling Christmas. All of Christmas is over. So, so that is, we're still figuring out how that's going to work, how that's going to look. And you realize how much of your job is actually not just taking care of bumps and bruises and musculoskeletal medicine, but there is that psychological and mental health component too, which is big right now. And, you know, obviously the, the hotspot, Ben kind of alluded to it, you know, the hotspots have switched. Um, uh, you know, uh, Jay, who is about six miles from my house right now, as well as uh, Anna uh, and Brandy and a couple other hotspots as well. What, what, what's your feelings of now, you know, and I guess I include myself, but in a, in a, the newer hotspot, um, how, how are you all handling it right now uh, with respect to your professional careers and with everything going on? I guess I'll start, Jason. Um, so we're in Gainesville, and we're, we're not one of the bigger cities of Florida, but we're surrounded by Jacksonville, Orlando, and then Tampa, and then gets Miami south of us. But we're kind of a hot spot in the fact that we are a smaller town, but we get influxes of college students. And so we, um, we sent them all away in March, and we kind of had this quiet time where we didn't have much going on. Uh, we had a little bit of out, right after spring break, people came in and then we sent them out. And so we had probably a month there in our college students that was busy. Um, but as we brought our athletes back this summer, uh, within the first couple of weeks, we, we started to see a lot of cases in our athletes. And most of it was due to things they were doing outside of athletics with, with college students. So our, our bigger concern now is what's going to happen when students come back. And even though things are online, a lot, of, a lot of students want to come back and their leases are still in place. And so August 1, I saw a lot of people moving in and we think that's going to keep happening throughout the month when we start up in August. And then professionally, I, I do a lot of concussion work. Well, this has really put a dent on that, which is good for patients, but um, we've had very few concussions because everybody's gone. And uh, I've found myself in the odd position of actually encouraging people to ride scooters, which I've spent years telling our athletes, don't ride those, and you gotta at least wear a helmet. And, and, um, and now, you know, we're saying, well, that's not a bad way to get around. You're not, you're not carpooling with people, and we still have to teach them, hey, you're going to the test site, don't carpool over. We've had athletes going to our onboarding campus test site, riding together, and someone tests positive, and then the, the people in the car are now quarantined. So, been a lot of education. Um, 
with those those students. So we're we're uh, the other big issue is will we have sports? And that I'm sure Carly and others will talk about that. But that's our probably professionally a big big issue for me. I, I guess I can I can chime in and give the California perspective. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm here in Sacramento, which is the capital of California for those of you are West Coast challenge. And so though we're not the big city, we're not LA or San Francisco, a lot of the um, legislature around shutdowns has happened in our backyard here. Um, and right now the biggest hotspot in California has moved a bit from Southern California, Imperial County, LA County, now to Stockton, which is just south of where we are here in Sacramento. So we, um, initially did a fantastic job flattening the curb, so to speak, and our hospital actually had very few COVID um, patients admitted. Um, and our clinics never shut completely down. Some of the um, elective surgeries were, were canceled and they stopped having, you know, um, you know guests or visitors in, in the hospital and so we stopped having visitors being able to come in to the patients, um, with patients in clinic. And then that loosened up a little bit and now the numbers are going up. So we actually now have over 50 COVID positive patients in our hospital, which is much more than we ever had previously. Um, we're also a local, I mean, we're a regional referral center because we're a level one trauma center. So we, we get a lot of referrals from, from other places. And so we've actually worked on several things. We, we had some, some protocols for our patients in clinic, basically kind of shutting down if, if your pain is not severe initially it was if your pain is not severe don't come in and but if your pain prevents you from being able to take care of yourself properly in your own home or access your own home then we still had people coming in and we worked on um much like what um melody was saying uh, a plan to have the er redistribute people who are coming in with musculoskeletal injuries from the er to um, our clinic um, but then our ER doc said, no, nobody's coming in with musculoskeletal injuries because nobody's doing anything because everyone was, was sheltered in place. So, um, uh, so, so that actually it never really manifested. So we didn't um, have to do it. But now that things are changing and we don't truly have a shelter in place order anymore. And the hospital actually, all, four, the four big hospital systems in Sacramento have put together joint messaging that says it's safe to come to the doctor. Don't delay your care for other issues, cancer care, cardiovascular care things of that nature. And so we're trying to promote the um, safety of coming into the hospital to get the care that you need so you're not put, putting things off. And um, we'll see how that, that goes. Our, our clinic volumes have only been, initially they were quite down. We were lucky that we were able to flex to video visits pretty quickly because we already had a system in place for it. And now we are, are back up to, I would say maybe 80% of our normal clinic volume coming into the clinic. Um, but it's really on a week by week basis now with things stepping up in, in California. I guess I'm up. I can give the, uh, a little bit of the Arizona experience. I am in Tucson, not Phoenix. So, you know, Phoenix definitely, um, a lot more population density and hit harder than us. But, you know, the interesting thing was that when COVID hit and, you know, people in New York were, you know, getting pummeled, we had shut everything down here in Tucson. A lot of the clinics were shut down. We had all these backup plans in the ED. And the ED for the first several weeks was just like a literal ghost town. We didn't really have that many cases in Arizona at that point. I mean, we were way lower than, than we are now, even though we are on the downturn. But I mean, I just, of all the things that I never expected to, or I don't think anybody ever expected that, you know, that in the middle of this pandemic, when we're hearing reports of what's going on in New York and like literally e, the ER was a ghost town. Nobody was coming in for anything big or small or, or otherwise. And then, I mean, it even got to the point in the emergency department where they, you know, we had, we had um, created tents in front to triage COVID patients, et cetera. We had actually at one point um, broken them down because we just had so few cases and there was so little volume in the emergency department. I mean, I think the other thing I never thought would happen with, with uh, you know, people in the, especially emergency medicine doctors, but doctors in general, you know, um, seeing decreased visits during a pandemic, right? Um, but then, as you know, Arizona quickly transitioned to being a hotspot. I think one advantage that we had over New York is that we had several weeks to plan. And being part of a big healthcare organization, I have to say, 
they did, I don't think they do a lot of things well, I'll be honest, but planning for this pandemic, they did a really incredible job. Um, and I think we, um, we definitely benefited from that. They were really all hands on deck building the tent out front of the, of the emergency department. And, um, you know, you'd see these stats like, oh, you know, Arizona is at 91% ICU capacity. And what people didn't understand is that we opened so many different ICUs and flexed, um, so many extra beds. So that was like 91% of the, of the surge areas. Um, and now it seems like the um, number of cases are coming down. Who knows what's going to happen next? I think if we've learned anything from all of this is that we, you know, things can change very, very quickly. Um, but I, we never really saw a situation in Tucson like they did in in New York. Clinics are, clinics are back open. You know, our sports medicine volume is definitely down from pre-COVID times, but we are seeing patients in person. Um, our telehealth is not as robust as we would like, but to be honest with you, I find we give all the patients an option about whether or not they want to come in or do telehealth, and they almost all want to, um, they all want to come in, which is, which is interesting. Um, but so I would say that, you know, we, I think the big flex was that we needed to open a lot of extra ICUs. The emergency department luckily never actually became super overwhelmed. We had a ton of ICU support. And like I said, we had, we had had time to plan. And I do think that they planned well. We had an Arizona triage system where at one point the cases were the highest and we were lit um, there was a central area that was literally triaging patients from all over the state to different hospitals where they had ICU beds um, available. So right now that, like I said, things are getting better. We're definitely seeing um, our, our ED volume is not up to where it used to be, but we're definitely seeing a lot more um, sort of typical ED cases. One thing that is definitely going up is our uh, psychiatric cases, depression, anxiety, substance abuse. I'm sure nobody's surprised, but we are definitely seeing one of the EDs I work at. There's a um, there's a psych hospital there, and we are definitely seeing an increase in um, psychiatric emergencies. Um, so only time will tell. You know, I think the next big the next big hurdle, like many of us on this call is, you know, the return of college, the return of schools, the maybe return of sports and um, what that is going to do. So that was a perfect uh, lead in. Thank you, Anna, for uh, my next question. Um, and I'm going to uh, ask this specifically with consideration for Alex and John Dresner from the high school perspective is how are you planning for kind of COVID-19 prevention? And I say that from the perspective of the high school athlete, not necessarily going back to school, because that's a whole other uh, issue right now. But I think from the high school, when it's a very difficult to mandate anything in a lot of these are recommendations, how, given your roles, um, how would you recommend or how are you planning for COVID-19 prevention with PPE consideration, social distancing, physical distancing, masking, et cetera, for the high school athlete? That's a big question, Jason. Um, and first of all, just uh, good evening, everyone, and, and thanks for having me. I, I just want to commend uh, Jason and Ashwin and uh, Jim, Will, Heather, just for creating a forum like this. Um, it's really important, especially at a time like now, where evidence is limited and we're all learning from each other. And so sharing ideas and our experiences on forums like this is exactly how we're going to get through this and do better uh, for our patients. Um, you know, Jason, in terms of addressing that question, I think I'm going to focus on the medical side of just, you know, what should the PPE look like um, for maybe a high school student athlete if they had the opportunity to play sports, rather than focus on the physical distancing, mask wearing, hygiene standards that I think we're all sort of familiar with and, and reading about from, you know, that, that other organizations are creating. But you know, this, this uh, certainly creates some uh, difficult times in terms of getting PPEs done, um, having capacity just to see uh, as a primary care physician, to see the patients that you want to see. Um, there's been uh, discussion about should PPEs be allowed to be delayed if they were done last year and your state required it every year. Um, I think in this setting, we are, and we're going to talk more about this a little bit later in terms of the cardiology world, when you asked the question earlier of uh, individuals, how has this affected you? You know, I, I've seen the 
both the research and the cardiology world just explode in newness. It's like everything has to get recreated because we have COVID um, and we are learning so much new. So with that uh, evaluation for the high school student athlete, we had the opportunity to work with the National Federation of High Schools and, and a group from AMSSM to talk about this and, and understand what are some of the considerations and specifically what are some of the cardiopulmonary considerations for the high school student athlete. And, um, you know, it's important to that any student who has been confirmed to have COVID-19 see their clinician before they return to exercise and sports. And, and I think that's probably the biggest take home message. You know, in that evaluation with a clinician, the most important thing is a solid symptom screen and review if that person has any ongoing cardiovascular symptoms. Um, we've all heard about the potential for myocarditis and myopericarditis in uh, individuals uh, who've been infected with coronavirus. And that's true really at any age and probably any severity level, including some of our asymptomatic cases. Having said that, we also have to think about our, our, our levels of expertise, our infrastructure, and our resources. And so I don't, I don't know if there is an evidence-driven answer to what that cardiology evaluation should be in the high school student athlete. Um, if you don't know how to look at an ECG, you, you shouldn't do an ECG, regardless of the circumstance. Um, you may need to ask for help. I think the areas we all agree is if they have had a severe illness, and I'll, I'll, I'll define severe as being in the hospital. If they've had um, a, a pretty significant flu-like illness with chest symptoms, um, shortness of breath, chest pain, et cetera, I think that warrants additional cardiology evaluation. And if you've had any amount of COVID and you have ongoing symptoms, chest pain with exercise, um, dyspnea on exertion, more fatigue or exercise intolerance than uh, usual, I think that warrants more investigation with cardiology and, and additional ancillary tests. And so those three, those three categories for me really warrant more investigation. And I think you cipher that out through that clinician uh, initial evaluation for anyone with confirmed COVID or, or even suspected COVID in the past. I was going to thank Jason for allowing me to be here, but now it's two back-to-back -back conferences where I've had to follow Cindy Chang and John Dresner, two of our giants and two of my biggest mentors. So th thanks for that, Z. Um, but um, I, I think the one thing I'll just say about the PPE that um, just tailor off of what um, John just said is um, not only do we want kids who've had suspected COVID seen, I think we really want to get all of our kids seen. Uh, and not just from a sports physical perspective, but from a well child check. Um, you know, one of the other speakers had, you know, mentioned we went through this whole process of telling everyone not to come, and then we sort of realized the fallout uh, of that. And so, um, you know, we've seen dramatic reductions in vaccination rates across the country. Um, we see all again the the mental health aspects, and so there's. Uh, you know, there's always been this tug of sports physical versus your well child check. And, and I think this is another opportunity for us to use that sports physical as an entry into the healthcare system and to capture these kids and see what's going on in their lives and try to address all the other needs that they have. Um, uh, in addition to that, you know, are they ready to play, play sport? Um, I think the other thing that I'll just comment on and maybe touch a little bit on that infection control aspect of it is, you know, there's so much, there's been so much focus in, in the college and professional landscape on, you know, testing and all the other things we can do to create a safe environment. Well, in the high school world, there's, there is none of that. And so how can we create a safe environment or mitigate risk in a world of very limited resource? And so it does fall back to all those community things that we're, we're telling the general population. Um, but I think we need to be creative on how we try to implement that and, and push that in our, in our high school world. And like Jim, like John said, I'm not going to repeat all the, the masking and six feet away, but I do think, you know, using our coaches, using ath athletic directors in your communities, using people who have a really strong voice that are respected in the sports world in your local community to, to be your mouthpiece and try to get them to encourage uh, their kids and, and those in the community to, to follow those guidelines. We all know it's become, politicized in a lot of way and there's a lot of debate about it but if you can get those folks on your side I think uh, that's a way to hopefully try to push and, and get them to understand that 
um, they, they control a lot of the outcome of whether or not they have a sports season. So the more you can get them on board with those policy decisions, the better chance we have of, of being successful. So it's, it's interesting, um, you know, Alex, what you just mentioned is, uh, and I think a lot of us uh, on this call know, you know, we told folks to stop and now we wanted to start. Maybe we don't want to have big gatherings or not. I'd like to actually bring Chris in and provide maybe a little perspective from the military side because we can't tell the military not to show up. You know, that, you know, it, it's part of the job. So I was wondering if you can maybe comment from maybe uh, in your area, but from the military perspective, the unique challenges that, that you're seeing and maybe things that you're allowed to say publicly that um, are maybe not have been publicized as much as we're hearing about with sports and school and things like that. Um, it might be a very uh, enlightening for all of us to learn about. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, first off, uh, Jason, for uh, the invite, and I'm really happy to be part of this panel too. Uh, so, uh, so thank you for that. Um, yeah, it's uh, definitely been a challenge, you know, in uh, how we've uh, uh, done this because yeah, we really didn't have much time to stop. Uh, we never stopped training everybody. Uh, just to put this in perspective, what training doctrine uh, command does, you know, we we train everybody, uh, we recruit everybody, and so everybody that gets recruited uh, goes into basic training and then goes into the next phase, so advanced individual training, which is where you learn how to be an infantry, you know, soldier, uh, artillery person, you know, or uh, medic, uh, MP, you know, whatever it is that job is. So all the way throughout that, at any given day, we have about 55,000 people in training. Um, and then so we did do a pause, you know, for uh, two weeks where we had to convince uh, Congress basically and the Army senior leaders that what we were going to do was safe, you know, to bring everybody in because uh, we're bringing everybody in from all over the United States um, and uh, putting them into, uh, for the Army, we have four main training sites um, uh, at uh, Fort Jackson, Fort Benning, Fort Leonard Wood and Fort Sill, uh, Oklahoma and Missouri for those other two, uh, South Carolina and uh, Georgia. And so uh, you kind of think about, you know, some of these hotspots and we had to figure out, well, people who are coming from some of those hot areas, we don't bring them in um, and uh, we can sign them up, but just say, okay, we're, we're just gonna wait on you uh, for a couple months until things settle down in your area and then bring you in. Uh, we've been very fortunate and we'll get into the testing too, but uh, we were able to uh, secure a fair amount of uh, testing capability at all of our training sites too, to screen everybody ahead of time, you know, as they came in to, um, but we did change, you know, the way that we did basic training um, um, overall. Uh, so uh, basic training is 10 weeks. Uh, we switched it around um, to where first two weeks that you come in and there's 14 days of quarantine. Uh, you're still training during that time, uh, but we put everybody into a group of 30. Uh, that's why we have to screen everybody ahead, you know, because um, if you, I, I, I'll bet if you asked any mom or dad in the United States and said, hey, we're going to put your kid in and then put them in with somebody else that's coming from New York City uh, at the time when they were hot or Phoenix, Arizona right now, uh, they'd say, oh, hell no, we're not, we're not letting you have our kids. So we had to figure out how do we, how do we, uh, you know, kind of like, you know, ease everybody's concerns. And so uh, what we did is uh, test everybody, put them into small groups, quarantine everybody for that time, you know, train them, modify our training so they're not they're not uh, going out doing a lot of physical exertion during that time, but it's more of the uh, indoctrination into the program, you know, what it is that we do, what it means to be a soldier, uh, learning some of the preventive uh, techniques, preventive health, you know, uh, for heat injuries, you know, so on and so on, all that training. Um, and then changing that up. After that two weeks is over, um, then bringing them out and then putting them into the, what is more of the traditional uh, training. Uh, we do mandate uh, the masking for everybody. Um, and I'll, t I'll tell you, I mean, we actually are very fortunate in the military because we have like the ultimate control over everybody. I think prison systems have more control, but, you know, but really, uh, but for the military side, uh, we can say, hey, you're going to wear this mask. And if you get caught not wearing it and you get in trouble and, and you know, you'll have a drill sergeant that's yelling at you to get it on. Because honestly, the drill sergeants don't want to get sick either. And so they're, they're telling everybody, hey, you're going to follow these rules and they follow them. And so, uh, so we've been pretty fortunate with that. Uh, we did change some of the training um, you know, so that as, as much distance as we can have apart from each other, we do it. There's some training that you just can't. I mean, if you're going to, uh, there's only so much space with, inside of a tank turret. And so <laughs> you, you can't expand that out. And so everybody's got to be right next to each other. And, you know, and we do have to keep moving on with that. Uh, but like you said, you know, we don't, we don't get a chance to stop. I mean, uh, um, 
uh, there's a lot of people watching what it is that we do and how we got affected by this and we didn't stop and uh, we were able to demonstrate that we could continue doing everything that we need to do for the United States too. Well, so kind of taking what everyone has said so far, I want to bring in uh, John Finoff and, and Carly Day and then we can bring back Jay uh, Clugston as well is we get a little bit in the specifics about testing that, you know, there's a lot of discussion about, is there enough materials to test? And then do you do PCR, do you do antibody, do you do saliva test, do you do the, uh, the nasal swab, do you do both nostrils? One, I was wondering if uh, Carly and Jay can comment maybe from the collegiate level and then John, uh, obviously from the USOPC perspective, if you have any comments on and maybe what your organizations are doing and then maybe things that you're starting to see, obviously with sensitivities and specificities since there's some concern about that as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm Carly Day. I'm the head team physician um, at Purdue University in the Big Ten. And uh, gosh, there, I could literally probably host a Zoom that lasts 40 hours and not even have enough time to talk about what we've been going through the past couple months. Um, but it's been quite an experience. Um, as far as testing goes, you know, we've been fortunate at Purdue. We have something called the ADDL, which is a veterinary lab, and they got CLIA certification to run um, human samples pretty early on in this, sort of gearing up for a, a big um, wave that has only hit us, you know, partially. But with that, they run PCRs all the time on animal samples. So we can dr technically drop off a, a sample around 10 a.m. and get a result at 3 p.m which seems like cheating compared to the rest of the world. So, um, or if we do it in the afternoon, we'll get a result the next day. So we haven't, I mean, we've had no issues with supplies or testing. Uh, for us, it was figuring out how to actually perform that many tests at a time with not really any nurses or anyone. It was just me. So we um, have collaborated a lot. And that's one of the silver linings of this is, you know, we worked with our Department of Pharmacy and our School of Nursing. And they all, we got nursing students and the pharmacists actually were, are able to do swabs like they can at like a CVS. But, um, and now we just trained our athletic trainers. So now our athletic trainers are doing swabs. We do mid turbinate swabs. We're not doing NP swabs, but we have like a well-oiled machine. Today we did 250 tests in about four hours, but we were standing around waiting. So we think we can probably run those 250 tests in um, two hours or so if, if we have all hands on deck and we have a whole system to do it. And um, it's been really interesting. And, and like I said, I've, I've learned a lot, but really collaborated a ton and everyone's doing stuff that they've never done before, but we're all working together on that. And Jay's my new best friend because we have team physician Zooms now where we all uh, get to know each other. That has been a, a big plus. I've gotten to know a lot of great people. So I'll let John speak about his thing first, if you don't mind. Sure. Start. Carly, I want your well-oiled machine. That's uh, pretty slick that you've got going on there. That's a lot of tests in a pretty short period of time. Um, so, yeah, I, my name is John Finoff. I'm uh, the chief medical officer for the USOPC. And uh, it was interesting. I started in my position on March 2nd, uh, and that was we had 56 cases of COVID-19 in the United States total at that point in a single death. And within two weeks, we'd closed our Olympic and Paralympic training centers. We delayed, uh, the games had been delayed, and uh, everything had obviously changed in the world. So it's it's been an interesting time. Um, as far as our testing protocol, what we are doing is uh, we are bringing athletes in in different phases. So we've ranked our sports based on risk. Uh, so if you can do a sport where you have either protective gear or you're not around anybody, so if you're a shooter, um, then your your risk is is really really low of of uh, spreading the disease or contracting it, and so it's pretty easy to control the environment. Uh, and then the next uh, step up is a group of people who have to have closer contact, but may have um, protective equipment, or it's just not sustained. It's very fairly brief. Uh, and then the last one is is where you have close sustained contact with no protective equipment. Um, and so. In each of our phases of letting athletes in, we're escalating the risk of the sport that we're uh, bringing in. 
we're doing a combination of on and off-site athletes and we're not mixing the two and both the the on-site athletes live in their individual rooms the off-site athletes are supposed to be sheltering in place in their own home uh, and then they don't train together on site. So we clean the facilities in between use of our on and off site athletes. When they are first arrive, uh, we first do an informational webinar where we go over all of the policies and procedures and infection control uh, that we're, we have in place. They quarantine uh, and on days four and five of that quarantine, we do PCR tests and we're doing a spit PCR, so saliva, uh, which is quite easy. But we don't have a local lab, so we're sending it to uh, labs. We have to overnight it, so it's essentially a 24-hour turnaround to get the test results back. Um, but we do two PCRs, day four and five, and we also do an antibody test. And the reason that we throw in an antibody test is not to make clinical decision-making about whether they do or don't have uh, COVID-19 currently, but it's to see whether they may have had it previously, whether or not they knew it. And uh, it helps us with our cardiac screening. Um, really, we're doing a combination of PFTs and, and uh, ECGs and troponins. Uh, and if somebody has a positive PCR or antibody test, then we add in an echo. Um, so far, it, it's gone well. We, uh, it's, uh, we've only had a couple of positive cases and we had no spread from those individuals. Um, we had a couple of positive uh, antibody tests both of whom did not know that they had previous COVID-19, which is very interesting. Um, but as John said, you know, a recent cardiac MRI study out of Frankfurt showed that 78% of people, uh, regardless of severity, have cardiac involvement. And so that's a big deal for us. We wanna make sure that we're identifying those athletes and, and uh, screening them appropriately. We're, we're pretty similar to Carly, and um, I, I would just mention that we've, we've encountered some ethical issues on supplies, and in a lot of the meetings we've been on, there's been talks about that, you know, how do you, how do you justify pushing athletes up to the front of the line and things if, if you do that, which, and how do you use all these supplies if you're going to test multiple times? Um, We've been able to do in our asymptomatic people that we think have a low prevalence, we've, we've been doing batch testing. So we, we pool samples and we've gotten up to approval to do 10 to one now. So we've been trying to do that um, in our students and faculty that have come back to campus. We've, we've about at 30,000 tests now and they run through two parking garages in Gainesville. Uh, and that's worked pretty well, but the, and they also put those people at the back of the line for processing in the lab and then our clinical tests, if someone we, we think is symptomatic or we see in the office or telehealth and we order it, those, they aren't batched and those come back. We've, we've been lucky having our lab right on campus and they're not quite as fast as Carly's, but they're you know, 12 to 24 hours. So we don't know how long we'll sustain that uh, as supplies may change. But just the ethical part of that has been interesting to talk through and explaining to athletes and parents and coaches that you know, we're part of society and we need to think about how we're using these for people that may not need the testing as much as others. The other thing I'll say is we have had a lot of talks about what are the best tests. I think most people here kind of settled in on PCR being the most sensitive and the one that you kind of want to go to as your main test. Um, a lot of the, the Autonomy 5 leagues have kind of centered around that. And if there's been some statements out that they would at least test once a week. And it sounds like the leagues have kind of, after that's out of now, kind of said, hey, maybe we're going to test more. And some of that's driven by what the pro sports are doing. And we had a conference call with athletes in our conference. And I was amazed at, at um, how many of them actually you know, want to be tested even more. And that was a big deal to them. Um, the other thing I was surprised that some of them, um, yeah, not not that they had pause, but they they they're very concerned about what we what we know about cardiac effects and long term effects, and we were honest with them and said we really don't know a lot. And then it um, it actually this call got leaked to the uh, Washington Post, and so you know, at first you're a little taken aback, like wow, we, we had this confidential call and now somebody recorded it and turned it into the Washington Post. They had an article on Saturday. But when you really think about it, it kind of showed you that there is a lot of pause there from our athletes. So you kind of think about why they did that. And um, so that's always kind of been present in our mind. And, and um, 
and, and with our testing, we got we want to be able to balance true need, what our athletes want, and then the, the supplies in the community. And, and I think any policy is needs to have statements in there. These are going to change and evolve um, from from month to month. So, and then obviously we, we've heard, you know, obviously very high level athletes. Um, and I think Jay, you alluded to it, that some folks just have more access to resources. Um, I, I'd be really curious. I, I want to briefly bring Chris back in and then, then shoot back to John Dresner from the military perspective, um, but then down to youth sports, which I think is in some respects much more challenging because of the, that lack of resource. So I'd be curious what Chris and then and John D, what, what your thoughts are um, before we finish up and go on to the next question. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it's a uh, um, it is kind of interesting. Uh, we do, you know, we did uh, secure a large amount of testing at our, our all of our training sites too. We were able to do about 800 a day at each of the four big ones, and then we have some other med centers that can do a little bit more than that too. Uh, and so uh, um, that's been good. And we have been doing a large amount of asymptomatic testing. You know, so the you know pretty much everybody that shows up has been asymptomatic. Uh, but like I mentioned, we are trying to protect them as they go into uh, small groups. We can't isolate them all. We can't, you know, quarantine them in individual rooms or even a double bunk room. Uh, they all have to be in a, in a bay area too. So we're trying to figure that out. We've had about a 1%, you know, 1.5% positive rate right now. Um, and then uh, we test them after the 14 days of uh, the restriction of movement, that quarantine time. Uh, so we test them again before we put them into the main training. And we've got about a 5.5% positive rate from that group. Um, the reason that, uh, uh, and, and, and it's really important and every senior leader that I talk to, because they want to say, hey, I want that test too. I want to be able to do that as well. And, you know, we really are, you know, part of what we're having to do a lot is really make sure everybody understands the high level of false negative, you know, rate that you get with the PCR test. And everybody's really wanting to hang their hat. Like, hey, if I get that test, I'm going to be totally secure. And that's why I say we're actually a very good population is because I am bringing in people. I'm putting them into the 14 days of restriction of movement, you know, the quarantine time. The drill sergeants are living with them during that time. So nobody's coming in. We bring their food to them. They don't, they don't interact with anybody else. So we are protecting them a lot and putting them in that bubble. So that's how you really get that reassurance and you can really be a little more reassured that everybody that's then going into the rest of the training pipeline is fine. Where we run into problems on the military side is we have so many other courses that we do, but uh, for like officer side, they all live off post. Well, okay, if I tested you on day one, but then you know seven days from now, you ended up eating at another restaurant, you went to the grocery store, and whatever else that happens to be too. Well, there was no use in me using any testing. And then we have to do the other measures to try to keep everybody safe. So we're, we're really not, you know, working on, you know, like trying to test everybody, but really just a select population that we can wall off really well um, and then keep them safe. Uh, highly successful, you know, for the walling off, you know, for the basic training and the advanced individual training. Um, but, uh, um, and, um, and just really having to rely on some of the other measures, you know, um, uh, you, know you know, for the other courses and then for um, other, other folks that are going, that are uh, in the uh, other units. You know, Jason, thanks for asking about the, the youth sports. I think this is a really important um, area to address because for all the fellows who are on the call, you know, AMSSM is, it, don't think your sports medicine fellowship is just about treating, you know, elite sports and college athletes. Um, you know, I think the youth sports community really needs a lot of our attention. In terms of testing, you know, testing is not realistic in youth sports. It's not realistic in high school sports. And the reason that we test for sports is when we're asking athletes to do things where they can't effectively physically distance from each other. And so, what we have to realize is that it's not an all or none. It's not, oh, you can test and play sports or you can't test and therefore there are no sports. So in our community, I work very closely with our youth soccer uh, club called Seattle United. I run their medical advisory uh, committee. Um, I've been intimately involved with that, that club for about 10 years. Um, and we started working very quickly, pretty much the same time I was working with UW and the Pac-12 about our rollout plans for small group training. I started working with our youth soccer club about what would that look like to get kids back on the field when our public health officials say we're ready to do that. And what would that look like for a youth soccer club? 
And quickly that went up the chain to Washington Youth Soccer. And before we knew it, we had some state protocols rolling out about small group pod training. So basically think of one team, uh, four groups of five kids or less, taking up about half a field, so four quadrants, all uh, adequately physically spaced, passing the ball uh, back and forth, doing individual dribbling drills, et cetera, doing some conditioning. Um, in our youth soccer club, we have about 2,500 athletes on 150 teams. We've been monitoring them for attendance, um, sickness, new positives, et cetera, pretty closely for the last month. Um, with every team practicing two to three times per week. We have had a few cases of new infections in players that have come from home. We have not had a single case of a player spreading their infection to another player. And the same thing at the University of Washington. When, when, when we're doing small group training and all of the physical distancing and cleaning that we can, et cetera, that is a safe way of exercise. And I think that's sort of lost. And it's something that you know, uh, there won't be fall sports in, in Washington for high schools, but that shouldn't mean there aren't sports, meaning that a lot of the sports can still get back to some of this small group training once the kids get their PPEs in, once we figure out and help those schools with those protocols and how to get their kids out there. And that'll be so important for so many reasons, physical, mental, et cetera. And so to me, this has really made me rethink, you know, what, what sports is all about. And it's, it, there's so much more than just the games and the competitions and the, and the higher levels. We got to get people back doing what they love and doing it safely. And I think they can do a lot of that by these sort of small group pod type sessions, depending on the sport and, and do it safely. And that's important. So if you're a fellow, think about how you can reach out in your community and help that happen. If you're supposed to take care of high school football and football is not happening, maybe help that school figure out how their athletes for the fall can do small group training safely. So it's interesting if, if we're going from team sports to maybe individual type sports or sport where there's a lot more individual uh, uh, aspect to it. I, I want to bring Brandy back in and then, then Melody, you know, there's two different spectrums of them thinking of one is the mass event. You know, obviously, um, many things have been canceled. Boston Marathon has been canceled twice. There's other, obviously, many, many events that have been canceled from a mass perspective. A lot of people have talked about, well, isn't there a way that we can just run and we just time ourselves and we send in the, the time or things like that? So I was wondering, uh, Brandy, if you can comment on really the COVID effects on mass events, which really hasn't gotten the publicity that a lot of team-based sports or professional or however collegiate sports has. And then the flip side, if, if Mel, do you want to comment, particularly in the sport that you're really in charge of as indoor professional sport, but it's really a lot of individual individualism. It's kind of the, almost the, 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 the opposite spectrum. So I wonder if, if you guys can comment next on, on how that's affected your, your respective sports. You can't quite outrun COVID despite how fast you run, but uh, you can run alone, you know, or with the people that are, are in your home. So with mass events, I mean, we were we were really lucky in some ways because many of the events, it, it, the, the bigger events were canceled. You know, those those big events like Boston, Chicago, New York, the events where the the um, just being there is 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 as much part of the event as actually you know crossing the finish line. Um, it, it's not the same when you cross the finish line in front of your house on Strava, um, but a, a lot of the smaller events were able to flex and go and go virtual. And um, which I think has been very good for the running community because if all of these businesses fail, it, you know, it's not like they run with a huge margin anyway, a lot of the smaller um, groups that do mass events. So um, I've been very in encouraged and a, a lot of our um, folks who come into clinic that are the weekend warriors or the recreational runners have been able to conti continue with their sport. And I think that that's been great. Um, for them, some people have been able to transition to doing, you know, wa walking a 5K, even if they weren't walkers before. So we've been able to encourage people um, to, you know, the, the year we ran alone was the, sl the slogan for one, one of the um, 5K, 10K half marathons um, that shifted. So that part um, has been really nice. But of course, uh, part of the reason why people love running is they can do it on their own time and they're not you know restricted to the gym or what have you but the the, the true mass events obviously the the last thing you want is ten thousand people stuck in a corral all together you know breathing hard warming up on each other so so that piece of it i think will really shift there have been you know region by region it 
it coming back to mass events will really depend on what your governor says, what this, you know, what what the mayor says, um, what the public health authorities say. Um, but we have some guidelines. At least there's an international trail running association that's put out guidelines. It's you know, it's like through Europe and and all over the world. They've put out some guidelines on when events come back, um, depending on the region that you're in, how we'll be able to safely distance. And it has a lot to do with people signing a behavior contract and a health contract as they register, maybe not having same day registration, not having standard corrals. So instead of everyone being together, there'll be single, single file lines that are six feet apart from each other with six feet of distance in between each group. And people have specific start times that they'll be allowed to, their group will go at a certain time and then your group you know, goes 30 minutes later and the next group goes 30 minutes later and you have to wear your mask until you cross the start line. Everyone will have an electronic chip time so that your timing starts when you cross the start line and stops when you cross the finish line. You have to mask again once you cross the finish line. And if you've dropped your mask along the way, then the team has to have enough masks there to give people as they finish. So a lot of people are putting energy into how to do this. Do you have aid stations or not? And they're saying if you're going to do a 5k, you know, no aid stations and people have to sign their contract that they'll bring their own, um, you know, their own hydration. And if you're doing something longer. So I think it will really depend region by region on, on who's a hot spot. Like you couldn't have a race in Stockton now, but m maybe in some other areas, if they're, they're slowing down, you could. So I think that piece of it, people are really working towards the, the great thing is the training you can do on your own. Um, so, I mean, that, that piece of it has been, has been really nice for people, but, um, you know, the, the international events, obviously international travel has slowed down quite a bit. So I, I wear the hat as the, um, medical director for the California international marathon, which, um, is the last Boston qualifier of the year. We haven't officially canceled it yet. It happens the second Sunday and or the, always the first Sunday after Thanksgiving, um, or the second Sunday after Thanksgiving. And so we're, we're still, up in the air. I mean, I think we're probably going to be canceled, but they haven't officially canceled it yet. Um, but then with the international running events where I, I help, you know, nobody's flying anywhere. Like for, you know, many reasons, so Americans are kind of persona non grata right now on the, on the world stage. And so um, Americans c coming in, you know, coming into your area to do a running event or to do any event is a little bit touchy. Uh, for, for a lot of places. So a, a lot of the races who, um, you know, cater to uh, American um, international trail runners have um, sh shut down or, or postponed. Um, those are not so likely to be um, switched to a virtual event because the terrain is much a part of the race. Um, you can't just run a, a flat road race or, you know, it's, it's not the same with trail running. So we'll have to see, and you know, one of the big groups that I work with, they have, do one big event each year at a new location and they had canceled that for this year and postponed it until next year. Um, so we just have to see how those, um, how, how they go. Melody, what about you from the uh, kind of, you know, a sport that's indoor, for the most part indoor, where the, you don't have the ventilation, um, dancers being professionals or individual with their team, it's definitely a unique sport. How, how have things been going for you and what's unique for, for your side of things? Yeah, you know, those old buildings and those old theaters, they're notorious for their poor air quality. I have patients all the time when we always know their asthma is going to act up when we start actually going into the theaters. So when we open up a building though, it's actually not even just those athletes we have to think about. We have to think about front of the house and back of the house, like the stage crew, the costumes, who's moving all of those set pieces around. We have to think about how we're gonna keep them safe and have make sure they're keeping our performers safe. And most of those groups, they all have unions. So there are collective and bargaining agreements that we're having to try to work around and update because of course they didn't have any of this in mind when they were negotiating their last round. Um, but also then, how do you make this economically feasible? Do you bring spectators into the theater? Do you sell tickets online? Do you record and then have people do a streaming service, kind of like Hamilton? Um, they released their movie early as opposed to releasing it in the theaters. Um, for dance in particular, especially partnered dance like classical ballet, a lot of couples 
actually live together or they can become a small bubble. So they are actually are already rehearsing together. We give them masks so that they can practice um, how that feels. A lot of them have anxiety, so we'll give them like their own pulse ox so they can document that they actually aren't desatting, even though they might feel short of breath. So they can get used to it. Just ways to try to control getting them ready to come back. But we know this can be done. I have a patient that's on Phantom of the Opera, the international tour in South Korea, and they've continued to perform and they have been able to do so successfully. Of course, South Korea isn't known for their unions, um, so they don't have as many of those pesky things we have to deal with. But it is something that is successfully being modeled other places. So I think I'm hopeful once we get things a little more under control, that's something that we have, the people are already working out for us. So, you know, uh, the next two questions I have, I'm trying to get everyone involved, but these are, I think, a little bit more of the, the even within COVID, kind of the, of the hot button topics. I'm going to go with Dr. Dresner next. And, you know, he is, is really, you know, for, all, for most of the fellows on the call right now, really one of the more recognized experts with respect to cardiac medicine and sports medicine. So obviously, John, the, the question is, you know, all the cardiac concerns, and you, you alluded to it, I think uh, John Finoff also alluded to it, the research is just coming out, the, the, the data set, if you will, it's not necessarily specific to athletes, but we're really concerned, we're hearing about, you know, Eduardo Rodriguez with the Red Sox, there was a report of an Indiana University athlete um, that's been made public. Uh, what are your thoughts on, you know, what we're learning, what may be coming, particularly for the asymptomatic positives? Um, and I know it's a loaded question. I apologize, but that's, I know a lot of people are concerned about that. Thanks, Jason. Um, it's a really hot topic, and I think there's more questions than there are answers right now. And, and the evidence is, is really limited, and we're, we're, we're sort of doing this real time um, to try to figure out the best way to take care of our athletes, make sure they're safe, get them back to sports, et cetera. Um, you know, just to back up a little bit, you know, we know that for the hospitalized patients, about one third of them will have cardiac involvement, cardiac injury that could be stress, cardiomyopathy, or actual infection or inflammation of the heart. And, and from that, which we knew really back in, in, in probably April, it raised those questions. Well, what does that mean for our athletes who have less severe uh, illnesses? Um, John alluded to a recent paper that came out in JAMA um, from Germany where they looked at 100, 100 individuals who've had COVID with various uh, severity of infection. Um, about a dozen were, were asymptomatic, a lot of mild, up to about 50% were mild, um, and about one third were, were severe enough to be hospitalized. Um, average age was 49 and, and they were studied with a cardiac MRI about two and a half months after their, their infection. Um, and there were cardiac abnormalities on the MRI in 60 to 70%, depending on how you interpret the, the article, um, which raises a lot of flags. Um, I think what I've really stepped back to think about is some of the MRI findings that they describe uh, probably don't cross the threshold for a diagnosis of myocarditis. Um, we, we don't really know from that paper some of the nuances of how many really had you know, T2 findings or edema that would say the, the infection is acute. We don't really have any information on LGE um, in, in terms of how many of the asymptomatic or mild infections truly had scar or LGE to say that they had myocarditis back when they had it. We don't have the size of that of those findings um, to say it was clinically relevant. There's been literature on MRI findings in individuals who don't have uh, prior COVID, you know, the pre-COVID era, there, there are MRI findings in athletes that show that some of them do have faint or old scar and we don't know what it's from. And so, you know, we, we could jump to a lot of conclusions to say everything they found was related to COVID, but it's, it's not totally clear. Having said that, we have all heard about the anecdotal cases of fulminant myocarditis in some, in some of our elite or even in younger athletes. Um, and now we've got over 4 million cases or whatever, and we're hearing about a handful of cases. So we don't really know what the, the prevalence of this is. Um, and how serious it is. Um, there is definitely a concern that regardless of the severity of illness, that even asymptomatic or mild infections could have complications down the road, could have complications that could be myocarditis, could be complications where they're at increased risk of venous, venothromboembolism or something like that. 
um, and we just don't have good data on prevalence. I think the whole idea that, you know, say it's, you know, even if it's 1% of athletes could have a heart problem from COVID, that's a lot. Um, and the studies are suggesting it's higher than that. And so uh, I'm concerned, you know, I'm concerned that COVID is clearly a virus you don't want to get. Um, hopefully you come out smooth and hopefully you don't have complications. Besides not knowing the prevalence of myocarditis or myopericarditis in our, in our athletes, we don't know the secondary outcomes which matter the most. How many of those people end up with um, some sort of heart in insufficiency? How many of them end up with arrhythmias? How many end up with a sudden death event? You know, we, we have no data on that whatsoever. Um, so these are definitely red flags that, that really require a lot of thought and a whole lot of research. And hopefully over the next six months, we're going to gain a lot of information, but we're trying to operate real time right now in, in terms of making clinical decisions or recommendations to our sports leagues on how we do things. And we really just don't have any, any robust data in this area. You know, um, been asked a lot of questions about how, you know, how would you screen athletes if you knew they had COVID? And, you know, it, I think you have to balance that a little bit with both your resources and infrastructure around you um, and, and probably the, the severity of the illness. And as I mentioned before, there's a couple of buckets um, for, for patients where for sure they need a very extensive evaluation. Anyone with post COVID who has ongoing cardiovascular symptoms needs, needs a workup that essentially ends with a cardiac MRI to rule out myocarditis. Anyone who's been hospitalized ends up with a workup that ends with a cardiac MRI, I think, to rule out myocarditis. Um, but, but that's not most of our, our young athletes, thankfully. So what do we do? You know, for me personally at the University of Washington, I, I feel thankful that I have good cardiology resources around me. Um, my evaluation is this, you know, I do a good, a, a really hearty symptom screen in, in the person I'm seeing. I do an ECG, a troponin, and I get an echocardiogram. And if any of those are, are, are abnormal or a little bit off, I move on to a cardiac MRI. If it's a new infection, then once they're cleared, I reevaluate them in short order within days to a week to make sure they're not having excessive cardiovascular symptoms with exercise. And again, if, it's, if it feels off, I wanna move on to a cardiac MRI. So in the collegiate setting with big resources, you know, that's a, that's a protocol that can work. In the NFL, it's a requirement. Everyone gets ECG, troponin, echo, but the resources aren't an issue. So when you back down to lower level NCA schools and, and uh, high schools and youth level, this becomes a real challenge about how to do it right. And so if we really follow what we know for sure, which I think should be evidence driven in, in areas where we don't have the resources, we know for sure if you've been hospitalized, if you have ongoing cardiovascular symptoms, those are two areas where for sure you need a big workup. Everyone else needs, a, you know, at minimum, a, a, a good hearty symptom evaluation. If you're, if you're capable of doing ECG, I think ECG adds value, but you have to understand ECG is not that sensitive for myocarditis and, and of course can have a lot of overlapping findings with athletic heart changes. So you have to know what you're looking at which will be um, sort of the topic of a lecture I give, I think, out in September uh, to the fellows where we look at ECG interpretation. Um, but again, I just think it, it, it depends a little bit on your resources expertise and, and the level of illness um, to know what to do. So with that, that, that kind of actually leads into the next question. I'm going to try to bring Ben and Anna back in to have not only the sports medicine perspective, but obviously being on the true front lines in the emergency room. Uh, ben obviously has talked about it in a little bit more detail from back in March and April. Anna, unfortunately, is going through it currently. Is So how long should student athletes in general, whether the high school or college, be out? And obviously, I think that's a question of, you know, we're following guidelines. Um, some of the guidelines are changing. Some of the guidelines are a little bit different, you know, symptomatic versus asymptomatic. Um, there definitely was that uh, infographic that has made it uh, around the waves from the British Journal of Sports Medicine, which is a very good infographic, but it's more generic. Um, uh, ben and Anna, what are your thoughts But bringing in the perspective of actually seeing this stuff um, really on the front lines? Um, I guess I can, can start. I you know, it's, it's a tough question because I, you know, we don't have a lot of data and it's, it's such a weird disease. 
um, that has such a wide spectrum of presentations and, and courses, you know, I think you can look at what's your best case. Your best case is you have no or minimal symptoms, you test positive, you're out for, for 10 days, 14 days, you get retested, it's negative, and then whatever sort of screening protocols, like John was saying, that we're going to put into place, whether it's cardiac evaluation, your PPE, all of that, you pass all of that, you feel good, uh, and, you, and you go back. Um, that's sort of your, your best case scenario, but it's still, you know, a few weeks. Um, but, you know, the, the comparison that I've been sort of drawing in my head uh, as we're talking about this is sort of with concussion. Uh, you know, there are people that we're seeing, and I'm even seeing people come into the ER just saying, like, I had COVID a couple months ago and I just don't feel right. And, you know, it's not something that is really an, uh, an ER uh, appropriate uh, presentation, but we get it all the time. That's, that's what we do. Um, and people get weird neurologic symptoms or, you know, change in their pulmonary status or just exercise tolerance, or they have weird pains and they have weird migratory joint pains and a lot of stuff that, you know, maybe there's a, a psychological component, maybe there's an anxiety component, maybe it's, uh, you know, rheumatologic or, or autoimmune sort of thing. We, we don't know. Um, and, you know, I don't think we're close to knowing how to treat those sorts of things, but I think that, you know, like concussion, when you have people who have those protracted symptoms and um, sort of atypical cases, you have to sort of specifically uh, tailor their recovery timeline and their therapies uh, to what they're going through. And, you know, we know a lot more about concussion than we do about COVID, but there's a lot we don't know about concussion. Um, and I think that there's a lot that as we go forward and start to deal with these, these athletes getting back that we're going to have to, uh, you know, learn a lot more and, and develop protocols to get these people back. Because I think there are going to be people, be people who take a very long time, whether it's because of myocarditis or because of um, pulmonary scarring or because of some other weird sort of uh, uh, just manifestation of, of the disease that uh, may take a long time to get back. Yeah, I, would, I mean, I agree with everything Ben has said. I think the the two main problems, in my opinion, are a, there's just lack of knowledge, right? We're at the very beginning of a brand new disease. We're not even six months in. So there's just, we just don't know. And there's no way for us to know. I, I feel like um, one of the positives is there's just so many great minds working on this all at once, but we still don't fully understand the disease. And even within that context, or within that context, we don't really understand. I mean, there's such a wide range of disease, right? There are the asymptomatic who have literally no symptoms to, you know, people who are dying from this. And we have some ideas about what the risk factors are for bad outcomes, but I don't think we fully understand who those people are. I mean, we keep seeing things like, you know, obesity and hypertension, but what about some of our athletes who might technically meet the obesity range, but they're, you know, very active and they might not have all of the syndromes associated with obesity. So I guess within that context, it, it, it's really hard to know. And I think a lot of it is going to depend on sort of the myocarditis, pericarditis um, component that John was talking about earlier. Um, so, so I think there's lots more that is not known than that is known. I know that, um, at the U of A, um, at a minimum, anybody who has tested positive for COVID, even if they are asymptomatic and even if they are not hospitalized or getting an EKG um, prior to be um, prior to returning to play, um, and if they're completely asymptomatic, um, the time frame for that keeps changing um, before they come back. But um, you know, if they are asymptomatic and they have a normal EKG, they are being cleared very gradually. Um, going through a protocol, et cetera, and halting any time that they have symptoms. Um, and I think we also need to probably cohort patients into those that have been hospitalized and have severe illness versus those that are asymptomatic or have mild symptoms and recover quickly. At least it seems at this point that those patients have a, not, a no, not a zero risk, but a lower risk of, um, of the bad complications. And outcomes, but I, you know, unfortunately, I think it's yet to be seen, and we're just going to have to see how it goes. I don't know that we have the resources to do EKGs and echoes and the full workup on every single person who tests positive for COVID. I mean, maybe in the athletic world, but definitely not in the in the you know world population. So, um, speaking of the world population, I'm I'm going to go to John Finoff 
next. Uh, you know, obviously, I think a lot of those of us who, who know you, you've been a mentor to a lot of us, definitely myself included. I've known you for many years. But we can imagine stepping into a position like you did and then obviously being part of something where the Olympics, Tokyo 2020, has now become Tokyo 2021. I was wondering if you uh, would be able to talk maybe for just like two, three minutes about some of the professional challenges of dealing on something that is basically on a world microscope in the largest athletic event, you know, short of the World Cup, um, what that has been like, I guess, from your perspective. Yeah, it's been very interesting and, uh, and so much more multifaceted than I expected. Um, you know, so for instance, just kind of going from square one, uh, when we shut down our training centers, there are a lot of places around. This was before the um, the Olympics and Paralympics had been delayed. And uh, almost all of the universities had also closed down their training facilities. But athletes around the world were still training. But our athletes couldn't. So they couldn't find swimming pools. So they were swimming in ba you know, backyard pools that uh, were in neighborhoods and stuff, trying to stay fit. Uh, boxers weren't allowed to go into rings, you know, it's just so many things that restricted their training. So they were really stressed, not just about the infection, but about the fact that they couldn't train and they felt like there was an unfair playing field. And at the same time, they stopped doing doping testing around the world because there was a lot of risk of doping control officers going in and testing athletes. So suddenly there was this new concern of, okay, I can't train. And wait a second. There are a lot of people that might be taking advantage of this situation and uh, potentially cheating in preparation for the games. Then they delay the games and suddenly uh, only 50% of people had actually qualified for the games. Uh, and so they still have 50% of the slots left and people aren't sure how they're gonna do that qualification because most of the competitions were canceled. Uh, so that adds a huge amount of stress. And a lot of athletes that might have qualified this year, you know, who knows what they're going to be like and uh, ready to go next year. And then there are a lot of athletes that were serving doping suspensions that it ends this year. And so they're actually going to be eligible for the Olympics next year. And they would have been ineligible for it. And I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. Uh, and so, I mean, it's been really interesting right now. What uh, we're wanting to do is figure out as international events are allowed, how are we going to get our athletes to those international events? Because the U.S. is, as was mentioned earlier, uh, persona non grata in a lot of countries. You have to quarantine for 14 days if they do allow you in. And so do you go and uh, sit in a hotel room for 14 days before you compete? I mean, that, that does uh, wonders for your training. Uh, and then you go to the next country and they see that your country of origin was the U.S. And so you have to do another 14-day quarantine. So we're working a lot right now with the State Department uh, and Department of Homeland Security to have reciprocal agreements with countries where their elite athletes can come here and do competitions. We can go there and do competitions. But what types of uh, protective mechanisms need to be in place? How are we going to get testing for our athletes in the different countries? Um, the international federations are trying to figure out how they're going to revamp all of their qualification criteria since a lot of competitions have been canceled. Um, so it's, it's really, it's, it's very interesting. I, I don't envy you at all <laughs> right now, but it seems like, you know, you and your team have done an amazing job. Um, you know, we've got about, you know, between 10 and 15 minutes left. And this is a question, I'll be very honest. I, I, I took this question specifically from, uh, from someone that a lot of us know from Irv Asif, who moderated a session similar to this on a different uh, webinar format about a month ago. And it's really about unexpected personal challenges. We always talk about, you know, professionally what we're doing, taking care of our athletes. But there, there's a lot of, you know, aspects of mental health and taking care of ourselves or taking care of our families and our friends and loved ones. Um, so I'd like to ask some of the group, I guess uh, next, Carly, maybe I'll, I'll go to you uh, next because uh, you know we're Facebook friends and I see a lot of the cool things you do with your kids uh, with games to keep them active. One of you probably saw my four-year-old Zoom bomb the call already. So, you know, Carly, I'll, I'll shoot it to you and then anyone else can join in afterwards. 
Yeah, I mean, as some people know in the college sports world, the summer is supposed to be our time to get a break. Um, the college football season is pretty grueling for most of us working seven days a week. Um, and so, you know, it, it usually is my time off, but it was a little quiet for me in March and April and got to spend some time with my kids when they were homeschooling. I have a seven-year-old and a six-year-old. And this summer, it's been really busy. I, you know, I have days where I have seven Zoom meetings a day and plus work on top of it. I mean, I'm working probably harder than I've ever worked in my life, maybe after intern year. And so um, it's been a challenge. Like I happen to be fortunate. My husband's a stay-at-home dad, so he's great with the kids. We bought a canoe this summer. So we've been, you know, trying to have some adventures. But I'll tell you, I, I'm, everyone who knows me knows I'm an optimist. And this has been a very stressful time for sure. There, you know, I, I will not deny that, but I just see lots of silver linings. So I've seen so many people work so hard and ask for nothing in return, including our athletic trainers. We just hired, um, we have a testing coordinator for our college that is really someone who works in events and she got repurposed because um, there's not a lot going on events and she, she's been here for a week and is amazing. Um, I've gotten to know all the Big Ten team docs more than I did before. I've gotten to know, you know, Power Five docs more than I've gotten to know them before. I've had Zoom calls with doctors from Japan, and we actually have a study that we just got IRB approved. Um, I was on a, a Zoom call last night with a guy from New Zealand because we were talking about our traveling fellowship. So I, I really, um, I'm just trying to embrace the change. And again, it's definitely stressful. It's our athletes are stressed, our athletic trainers are stressed, our everyone's stressed. But I'm, I'm just trying to do my best and sort of appreciate how hard everyone around me is working. And I'll let the, let the panel jump in next. Um, anyone um, wants to jump in and say whatever they, they might like to. Otherwise, I'll have to pick on Alex like I usually do. All right, Alex, I guess it's up to you. Oh, I'll, ju I'll jump in. All right. Brandy's my oh. only new friend. <laughs> <laughs> I accept Bitcoin for payment, Alex, just, just so you know. Um, you know, I think there, there have been a lot of differences that, that we have to acknowledge between people who are kind of single and, and only have to worry about themselves or people who have young kids in, in their home who are were no longer going to school, whether or not you have someone that lives with you that was also home to take care of them, whether you have elderly people in your home. So, right, so every single person there's not a person that this hasn't touched in a very specific way. You know, everyone has had a loss. All, all of the loss is kind of relative to the, the place that you are, but your own personal loss always feels like a big loss to you. And you can kind of take solace in, well, my loss isn't as bad as their loss. You know, some of us have had actual personal losses from people being affected with COVID. Um, you know, we've had changes to our work schedule. And um, I think just this... Um, the thought of trying to be overwhelmingly kind to people in the face of this very difficult time is something I, I hope as leaders um, on any scene that we can, we can model and trying to put ourselves in other people's shoes. We're, we're thinking about our athletes a lot, um, but as we all know, a lot of the people that we take care of in sports medicine are, are people who are not the elite athletes people who are the, you know, grandparents that just want to be able to get on the ground and play with their grandkids um, with the musculoskeletal care that we, we learn to provide. And so I think that um, taking a step, you know, kind of embracing and acknowledging the effect that things have had on you and your own personal life and not really uh, apologizing for it, L live in it a little bit, but definitely seeking the self-care things that you need to take care of yourself. Um, I'm not really a mindfulness person. I, I'm more of a like stream of dance class person, you know, but it, you know, and so we figured out ways to stream classes into our, you know, big office and have people, you know, participate at their own workstations, you know, doing something all streaming. So I think those little elements of self care in this time are really important and acknowledging that you don't know what the shoes are that someone else is walking in, whether they're your junior trainee or the senior person you're working with. And so just remembering to have kindness in your heart when you're taking care of all of the different hats that you're wearing. Uh, I think that was very well said. Um, but I'll still let Alex go next. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think that I can top that at all. That was, that was perfect, right. Randy. But I, I, I think, you know, we've used uh, similarly a lot of time to reflect. But I think the last thing I will sort of say is, you know, this is certainly a, uh, not just a one-item public health issue. This is a, a multiple uh, public health issue um, that we're all addressing. And so I think we need to take that into account and that there are people on both ends of the spectrum, those who are ready to jump back and play and have gone all out and others who are fearful and they all need our, but they all need our help uh, in one way or the other. And so uh, we have a lot of work to do still. And, and I think using Brandy's approach to the world and addressing those will hopefully get us, get us there. And um, if, if uh, I was going to say, John, go ahead. John, then off. You're next. Well, I was just going to say, I, I think what Alex just touched on that everybody's experience is different, and we have athletes who are ready to jump back in, and you know, some that don't believe that there is a virus, and then we have athletes like our Paralympians. I have multiple Paralympians with significant autoimmune disorders that suppress their immune systems, and if they get an infection, I mean, that, it's very likely that they're going to have a bad outcome. Uh, and so they're extremely fearful of being in the community or training or anything. And so mental health is a huge issue right now. I cannot tell you how much time I have spent on the phone and we're developing a big mental health program throughout the USOPC. And it's been a real challenge because I, I wish I had it in place the day I got here. Um, we're, we're building the plane as it's taken off. Uh, and that's and that's a real difficult thing to do because people need those resources right now. And so, uh, just being aware of that mental health demand that's uh, affecting all of us, and, and in particular our athletes. Izzy, hey I also want to give a, a quick shout out to to both Johns. Um, you know, very early in this process, um, the USOPC was the first one to sort of come out and dip their toes in the water for releasing the, the guidelines on return to sport. And, and Drez was the first one to sort of dip his toe in the water for some of those cardiac regulations. And that, that's a big step that I think the rest of us have continued to build on. And so I think they deserve a lot of credit for, you know, stepping out and, and setting those standards for the rest of us. Yeah, I think that's something that it's really challenging depending where everybody works and for all the fellows on you're, you'll learn this that you may want to say something but you can't say on behalf of your health system or your practice and can we recommend versus mandate i've learned those words very closely in the last few months what i can recommend but what i can't mandate um I, that i feel like those words are in my epic dot phrases every day now um but but i want to thank every single person on this panel i think we were up to 97 participants um, so probably somewhere around 80 fellowship directors and 80 uh, fellows combined for our first night. Um, I want to again give a significant amount of credit to Jim Miller, Heather Saffel, and, and Will Denk. Um, I'm going to give the last word to Will in a second, but this, this is really the start of hopefully a really, really nice educational initiative that again, I, I know that we've given a shout out to Ashvin Rowe, that, that uh, Rao, that really it was one of the first people I think back in February, March at UW, and there's been a few others that, uh, as well. Um, some folks at University of Wisconsin, Tom Trojan at Brexel, and some others have really sort of pushed the online learning with the foresight to know that we're going to need this this year and maybe beyond. So I'm going to stop talking now and give Will the last word before uh, we let everyone sign off, and hopefully we get this thing kicked off tomorrow with Dr. Casa's um, lecture. Jason, can I just jump in real quick? Yes, ma'am. I just, a message for the fellows, because I've talked to some people going into fellowship who are really worried about the experience or lack of experience they were going to get this year. So first of all, let me tell you guys that I learned just as much in my first and second year out in practice as I did during fellowship. This is, and I, today, this year I've learned more than ever before. So it's always going to be a continual process. People will understand as you go into the job market, if you need a little extra you know, guidance. Really, we all understand the situation you're in. So do the best you can to learn, get the experience that you can, be helpful to the people around you, because that's really what's most important in this world is we need people who are working together. You will get the knowledge. The knowledge will come to you. I, I did not, I'm old enough that ultrasound was not very popular when I was in fellowship. I learned it as an attending. I figured it out. It's just, you will have plenty of ways to learn as you go forward in your career. So don't stress about this year, just learn as much as you can, 
make yourself useful. And again, I promise you will get the knowledge you need to be a good physician eventually. So just try to, you know, make the best out of it and not worry about what, what's happening this year for you. Thanks so much, Carly. Thanks so much, Jason, and the rest of the panel for being here, spending all of your time. Um, I think this represents kind of the first of many lectures that will be coming up um, from so many different experts and educators around our country. Um, being able to come together like this um, is such a unique opportunity and being able to do this every single week is something that uh, I hopefully we can continue for not just this year, but beyond. And um, COVID may have sparked this, but hopefully we can kind of continue this even beyond um, after we're, we're, we're looking at COVID in our, in our uh, rear mirrors. And so um, just a couple of things uh, on Collaborate. We're sending all of our emails out via Collaborate. Um, it's a little uh, challenging at times to use initially, but please start to get used to it. Um, I got used to it. I really enjoy using it now. And that's where we will be posting all of our Zoom links. Um, additionally, uh, our next first lecture beyond this panel will be tomorrow with Nate and I moderating um, with Rob O and Doug Cassa talking about exertional rhabdo and heat illness, um, which we felt was rather appropriate, um, especially here in Arizona for the month of August. Um, and essentially we're gonna close this off, but thank you again to the panel. For those who wanna stay around, we're trying to keep this Zoom going as long as there is one participant in the Zoom because this is a very unique opportunity for fellows around the country to kind of discuss, meet each other. It's not something that you can typically do. Um, we typically uh, operate in our, in our silos until the, the annual conference where we get to meet some others, but um, this might be a great weekly, weekly thing to do to be able to hang out with some um, very interesting people. And for those who wanna stay on afterwards, please do so. But it's very, very late for those on the East Coast. Um, Thank you to everybody for being here and we really appreciate it. Thank you everyone. And uh, what we're gonna do now, thank you guys, thank you to the panel. Um, for those who wanna stick around, um, ask any sort of questions, feel free to do so. If you just wanna introduce yourself and say hello, where you're from, um, feel free to do so as well. Uh, we just want to kind of try and keep this as open as possible. And again, thank you to our panel. You guys are awesome. <laughs> this has been a great start. And obviously anyone on the panel, especially for your fellows, they're, they're probably going to sign off if they stay on. That's really nice of them. But especially on the East Coasters, we're probably going to be signing off. But fellows, by all means, you're welcome to, to virtually meet each other, just like you did at the fellows conference. I think it was two weeks ago. So, uh, Echo and everything. Everyone have a good night. Be safe. Wash your hands, wear your mask. And uh, <laughs> go Cubs. Self-care. 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 <laughs>
And we talked about if we're on the road and we get somebody that's become sick and we actually test them or we think in their pods or we think they have COVID, we thought, oh, we just bring them home. But they said that that's really under the jurisdiction of that local health department. And you could be violating their laws if you tried to move someone. And so we've, in our conference, have now said for every place we're going to play, we need to communicate with public health before we travel. We may, we'll present them our plan of how we might move someone safely and then have them sign off on it. But it came to quite a, a shock for the team docs to think, what, what do you mean? Would we even consider leaving somebody there, one of our, our athletes? But uh, in reality, that could happen. So we, we felt like if we talk it out ahead of time and, and get the proper permission that we would be able to move them. But that's, that's the one travel issue that's come up in our conference meetings. It's interesting. I, I didn't just bring it up just because, uh, you know, I like to annoy you a couple days a week here in Gainesville. Yeah. Literally, as I'm sitting here on my phone, it just popped up on Bleacher Report that the Cardinals are now allowed to travel again. You know, so that's obviously we're hearing about the Marlins, the St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, there's some other, you know, uh, 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 professional sports teams in the public eye where things are occurring at the collegiate level, which we don't need to name. Um, so it's, it's something I think fellows, you know, that you just would never even thought of before and it's something that we all have to be aware of so i in, in respectful of everyone else's time um and i can see who's still on here about half our, our faculty i can still see michelle lane still on here and then a few fellows i think it's probably appropriate we all start to sign off now it's 10 05 on the east coast seven uh on the west coast and for arizona for dr waterbrook who sometimes gets those time changes confused sometimes uh, in the winter. But thank you again for everyone still on. If there are questions, uh, by all means, shoot us an email. And hopefully, all fellows can log on tomorrow at, will help me out here, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, and everywhere in between. That's right. right. All right. <laughs> Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Have all a great right. night.